the O, the openness in OER, is really a, a huge value that is underestimated for, for many reasons. Zugehört. Der Podcast rund um Open Educational Resources. Diese Episode von Zugehört ist englischsprachig, weil wir in Norwegen sitzen. Und uh, mein Norwegisch ist sehr begrenzt und wahrscheinlich das der Zurau. So we'll switch to English now. And we have a special episode of Zugehört coming from beautiful Oslo in spring 2016. We're in Norway and we're going to learn more about OER in Norway. Krista Gundesen is with us. Thank you for taking your time. Thank you for having me. Could we start with you just introducing yourself? Uh, so my name is Krista Gundesen. Uh, I am the CTO of uh, Norwegian Digital Learning Arena. Uh, we are the largest OER pro project in the Nordic countries. We will have time to talk about the history and everything behind it, but what would be the like four or five minute version to tell someone who has never heard about NDLA, no digital Norway Digital Learning Arena? Norwegian D D Digital Learning Arena, yes. Yeah. Uh, NDLA, let's <laughs> do it short. The uh, NDLA, yes. and the, the four and a half minute version. Well, um, our, our mission is really simple to explain. We are, uh, our mission is to produce uh, learning resources for upper secondary schools in Norway. And we have done so uh, for 50 subjects, complete subjects. So like mathematics, um, for uh, Chinese now, it's released in a beta version, history, and of course languages like English um, uh, and Norwegian. Um, uh, and we've been doing so by producing content ourselves in one layer and having teachers and students um, join us in producing their own content in the uh, what we call layer number two. But um, our, our main focus is in fact hiring teachers for a limited time and, and, and having um, the best teachers in Norway produce OER for subjects in upper secondary school. So uh, the probably first question that comes to mind of at least everyone hearing this in Germany is How is it funded? Uh, it's funded by the regions. So um, uh, Norway has 19 regions and 18 of those, uh, they give us a cut of their, of their book money. They have a, uh, uh, a portion of their budget that historically went to books. Now they take 20% of that and they give it to us to produce digital uh, learning resources or OER um, as an alternative for those schools that are progressing into that paradigm. So 20%, how much is that in numbers? Uh, so uh, for us that will be uh, between 75 and 85 million dollars, uh, a million crowners, I'm sorry. Uh, so let's say eight to 10 million euros per year. Yeah. So we have to, to compare that to the size of Norway. So yeah. how many people are living in Norway? Uh, we are 4.9 million uh, and we have For us, we have about 250,000 students. That is our main target group. So uh, just uh, for, uh, to calculate this for Jimmy, it would be like 40, 20, uh, too much. I will post it uh, to the text afterwards. Yeah, but just uh, you're, you're 80 million, we're 40, so you're 20 times bigger than us, approximately. It's quite impressive. Yeah, so it's per capita, it's a, it's a, it's a substantial number. Um, but... Um, um, well, al also internationally, if you if you look at projects that want to produce high quality materials uh, with good teachers, it usually it is a costly effort. So, if you really um, uh, are are serious about producing um, content or, or OERs, and you're not using the crowdsourcing model uh, entirely, you have to, or we think you have to, fund the project properly. Okay, so, so how does it work? You already said you are hiring teachers. Mm. So they are not in school then. So what does the school say? <laughs> no, so, so this, is, this is typical. We, 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 we get assigned a subject from our board. Uh, let's say Chinese. And who's your bo board? Uh, the board is also our regions. So every region and sort of appoints one board member. 
Okay. So um, there are 18 board members. Yeah. Uh, and they say, let's say they, they gather together and they have, have, have talked to their people and they say, we want to do Chinese. And then we get, um, uh, well, we get Chinese as, a, as an assignment, and then we go hunting for the best teachers. Uh, and when we do so, we actually have to ask the school, of course, where they work, can we hire your teacher for a limited period of time? But usually that is, is, is not a problem. What is a limited period of time? So one subject, uh, we do a beta version of the subject. We just released uh, a couple of them uh, right in, uh, uh, this week. And um, a beta version is one year, one and a half year. Uh, in total, two and a half years. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that is, of course, some after work as well. Um, usually from start to launch is 18 month, uh, months um, in, a, in a beta version. Um, but but, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a real effort. And uh, we've tried to do it faster, but then you end up with a beta version anyway. And you have to do it uh, over again. So if you want high quality materials, one should say three years. So how many people are there working in your headquarters? Or do, do you have headquarters? Do we don't do have, do uh, we have no, our, our, um, we're particular in that or we're uh, significantly different than uh, any other uh, Norwegian um, publicly funded project. We don't have any real headquarters. We have one in Bergen, but um, that headquarters, uh, it, it rooms four people. And in total, we are 55 or 60 people. And they are spread all over the country. And that is also because we want them to be uh, near the schools. We want them to, even though they're working for us, we want them to, in fact, if it's possible, keep working at the school uh, and be near the, the action. Uh, uh, and we, we are very user-driven. It's, it's a term that you uh, that was coined many, many years ago for, uh, from from uh, design of, of solutions, but we are really focused on sort of tapping into the user uh, needs at any time. Uh, and to do that, putting everyone in a headquarter just keeps more distance between the students and, and ourselves. So, so we are 55 to 60 people spread all over the country. So can I imagine a teacher working half-time uh, is a normal teacher job? In school? In yeah, uh, some would do that. So we have we have contracts where they only work two or th one or two days for us. But if you're a part of a production unit, you work full time, and you only reside at your origi uh, original school. So if you're in the team that does history right now, you are full time. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, over a short period of time, and then you go back into your school. So how how many? Uh, is it one production unit or are there several projects? Each has one production unit? And yeah, well we have several projects um, and we have one head of, of content production um, and um, uh, Ragnar, which is the head of content production, and myself, we, we had the total production unit in terms of technology and content. But uh, for every subject, there is a, uh, an editor, uh, as it would be uh, for a publisher, and um, we have, we have sort of the size of the team differs from the subject, of course. Uh, and again, uh, for history, we have uh, teachers that produce content, but we also have collaboration with uh, many, many, many public units, like, for instance, the Norwegian equivalent of Europeana. Uh, we have what's called a Norvegiana, where we have uh, uh, access to data, historical pictures, and so forth. So. Um, just defining our production units as our teachers would be wrong. In many cases, we have collaborations um, either with other public, uh, public entities or even the market. We have one subject right now that we uh, entirely um, buy from the market. But our main strategy is hiring teachers uh, and make them produce OER. And every teacher that, that produces OER for us does so with a Creative Commons license, with m which means that um, it's possible for anyone else to reuse that content and make their own versions. Mm -hmm. Of course, for us, that is important in terms of that we are using public money to fund content and therefore um, releasing it under a, what's called a free license. And do you have a default license? CC BY. So we have, uh, we have uh, all the teachers sign a contract for this. 
Um, uh, and for the pictures, some of the pictures we have uh, CC by uh, NC. Um, but our main strategy is definitely uh, CC by. Mm -hmm. mm, so, what's the apart from the people you mentioned, the teachers? Is there a, um, stuff for I don't know technical graphical issues? How many are there? Uh, we have uh, so the, the technical teams are um, fairly substantial. We are the f 49th largest website in Norway. Uh, we, we have 65 to 70,000 visitors every day, which is not much in an international perspective, but in Norwegian, it's it's uh, substantial. Um, so I have uh, one team that runs the servers, of course, and has that as a as a main objective, and I have two. Um, uh, development teams, front end and back end, um, and that is that is uh, at, in, at any given time ten to twelve people uh -huh. working full time, um, running uh, the development, and that is everything from keeping the lights on and and, the, and, and things accessible to developing new solutions uh, towards the users, and of course that is only the technical department. We have a department that works solely to collaborate with the users and we have uh, at right now we have 42 what we call pilot classes uh, where we have an agreement with the school so we can visit them during the daytime and test our solutions and get actual feedback from actual um, students mm -hmm. are there any ways uh, y you get feedback beside these pilot schools so b your users are uh, allowed to change the content and do they do it uh, now this is really one of the things that we haven't been that successful with uh, i mean the the main production bit we, we we got that covered but in terms of having the users um commit their new versions and in fact contribute we have not succeeded um as well as we should uh, and we are uh, right now redefining sort of that workflow uh, after a dialogue with the users, because it it uh, it, it, it or, or, um, our dialogue shows that there are too many hurdles for their users. So it, in, in very simple terms, it should be easier for them to share. It should be easier for them to understand how to share so in terms of licensing and so forth. And one fact that we have sort of underestimated is the fact that we have produced our own content uh, over many years of high quality. So the new thing now is that we are making it easier for them to make their own versions of our own content, of NDLA content. While earlier, uh, that segment of user um, input has solely been, been sort of a sharing ground where they can upload their own content. So um, we have talked to many projects in Europe and other places. Uh, Class Cement, for instance, we had a whole team visiting them for two days. Class Cement is a uh, is a project in uh, in Belgium to find out why we haven't succeeded in terms of crowdsourcing because we have to. Uh, we have now fifty five subject as I uh, subjects as I mentioned, and we are building a legacy or, or a, what we call a, a content debt, mm -hmm. where we have to sort of keep paying on the same same uh, same color or we have to sort of keep it current so um but this is an area where we have we haven't uh, i think we haven't focused enough our focus has been the the production units and because they've been so su uh, successful but uh, we have full focus now when we are launching two new uh, user driven solutions um uh, this spring so but we we don't know yet. Maybe uh, by the end of this year, we will have a, a different sort of take on on the on the sharing part. Do you know what your users think about OER? So m maybe for ninety nine percent, it's only important that it's free. Yeah, I think I think you're totally right. Uh, first of all, we've asked them if they know about us, and most of them know about us. Um, but that we are an OER is not really important. It's the access to the content. So um, for us. To brand ourselves as OER is more important within the community that 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 we talk to in Europe, for instance. In uh, in, Nor in Norway, for the teachers, it usually is accessibility of the content and reusability. If you give them the confidence that they can reuse it in the classroom, uh, the term OER is unfortunately not not that important because, um, of course, the concept. The I I would say the the O the openness in OER is really a, a huge value that
that is underestimated for for many reasons. And do you provide like uh, editable content? So or is it uh, PDF? Uh, what do you provide as format? Now we, we have our, our 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 primary format is uh, websites HTML, and we also have um, a quiz engine that is HTML5 compatible, which means it's 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 uh, it's like a web page. You don't have a, uh, to do anything else. Uh, but but most of the content can be downloaded as PDFs. But that is not our primi uh, primary um, uh, channel, of course. Um, you can uh, access all our, our subjects by uh, via the the, the, the web page. We have loads of interactive content. We have loads of um, uh, sort of user experience uh, content. And of course, that would not fly on a PDF. How common is it to use uh, digital media in the classroom? So Germany, probably the most important thing would be the, the PDFs to print, yeah, uh, yeah. to bring into the classroom. Um, I would say that we have we have progressed uh, immensely over the last four or five years, but still, it's it's um, it's um, it's a huge question. You know, uh, how many teachers will will embrace the not the OER concept, but the digital classroom uh, as it as it is. Uh, but uh, I would say that this is changing rapidly right now. But if we if we rewind maybe five years, uh, the the situation was was really different. And and of course we are still at the ERG early stages of uh, changing from the physical paradigm to the to the uh, digital one. So. So. The funding you told us about is uh, like from the 18 out of 19 regions. Yeah. So why is there one that won't go with you? Oh, this is the big, uh, big question. Uh, th this is Oslo, the largest region. And uh, I have to say that my job is not politics. And this is politics. So <laughs> they, okay. they have political reasons for finding another solution. Uh, but what I can say is that I can see the stats of uh, children or, or youth in Oslo. Yes. And they are our biggest customer, without joining the party. And that's uh, how OER works. Yeah, d yeah. D is, is people from abroad using your content? Absolutely, yes. Uh, we have some English, we have some German. Of course, we're we're launching, launching in Chinese as well. Um, but of course, our primary uh, target group is not uh, abroad. And uh, and uh, but but it's accessible, and you don't even have to log in. But we can see that we have visitors from from abroad. And of course, we have uh, Norwegian schools abroad. Um, so, um, so, uh, and it's a, uh, it's uh, equally important for us to reach them uh, as it would be a school in Norway. Mm. Okay, so no, not getting too deep into politics, but <laughs> how does it come that you simply have twenty percent of the budgets for OER? Uh, this is really um, a change that happened in two thousand five, two thousand six, uh, where the the books in that paradigm went from being paid for by the by the by the parents to uh, to the, and it was a political decision it was supposed to be free uh, and, and that sort of change uh, uh, the question of uh, oer came up and uh, some really wise people back in that day um, led by uh, Evan Hennis, still running he's still running uh, NDLA today um, convinced uh, the the politicians, in fact, uh, in 18 of the 19 uh, regions to back a project where we say 80% to the old paradigm, classical books, and 20% to to NDLI. And of course, in terms of getting getting back something on your on your on your on your money, we have we have figures that are, uh, of course, really really good in terms of uh, the prices on books because. Uh, one subject right now, last time we did a check, per subject, per student, per year, was under one euro. And of course, compared to any book, any book you would like to buy from the shelf, that is really cheap. So um, um, so in terms of using 20%, uh, you, you will get um, uh, good, g uh, good quality and good content back on on your investment. And of course, for us being a very small country compared to, for instance, Germany, if you were to do the same in Germany, uh, even though you had to recontextualize some of the content for some of the regions in Germany, 
the business case on this is really, really good. But you have to sort of uh, embrace the thought of OER because the business case relies on the fact that when a teacher is finished with his work and is paid once, uh, he or she will not do the, the classical model where they get paid uh, another 10 times for the same content. So publicly funded content uh, is freely available for anyone else. That is the principle. It's also available for the publishers, isn't it? Do they uh, use it? Absolutely. We have a publisher now that are is, uh, is working on a project to cover the user needs of the non-digital uh, teachers. They're in fact taking some of our content and printing it in a more 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 uh, uh, good package or more like a, uh, a, a shareable package for those teachers that are still um, uh, loving our content but not loving the, the digital paradigm. So yes, we have some publishers, but this is not uh, at a large scale. Uh, a large scale. Um, I think we are not there yet globally either. I think some of the publishers are being are, are, are moving towards this. But of course, uh, in the future, for especially for small publi uh, publishers, it will be a gold mine if they can reuse publicly funded, high quality content. Uh, and uh, in principle, they can do so with most of our content today. When it started, um, that actually, actually, the twenty percent was um, taken from the budget for the mostly publishers. Yeah. So was it wasn't there a fight about it? Or Yeah, w w one could say that. Yes. Um, without saying too much, I would say it's been a it's been a, a real fight over many, many, many years. We've been to the ESA tribunal, uh, the European um, tri tribunal for um, for um, purchases, public purchases, twice, and we have won twice. So, just for the record, and uh, and the, and the and um, the issue has been if we are a publisher or not. And we've been been confirmed that we're not. We're a, we're a, we're sort of a collaboration between teachers and collaboration between public entities. And, and, we, and we think this is important because if a country like Norway or Germany cannot collect their teachers uh, and say let's produce our own content, uh, it would be um, it would have a dramatic effect on the um, on the on the crowdsourcing sort of um, uh, paradigm for for public entities. But But this fight has been ongoing since uh, the conception or uh, since we were uh, founded. Uh, but I think uh, over the next decade, maybe, we'll see a change, both in the market for publishers, but also for the ed tech market more general. So, but uh, if this has been to European court, this is already being clear clarified for all European or e union uh, European Union countries. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, for yeah. organizations that would be organized as we are, of yes. course, yes, yes, that's true. Okay, but uh, so for the time you are hiring the teachers, you are paying their salaries. Yep. Okay, it would be probably interesting to how, how this can be transferred to Germany because uh, there's a, the default model is the teachers are working in very different areas, but uh, mostly they are kept being paid by uh, the state where they are working at. Hmm. Um, Okay, so one um, thing I learned yesterday uh, is that you are preparing to work or to use Pinterest as a tool or an environment for learning. Mm. How's that? Well, well we uh, are doing a project called Learning Paths. So uh, we have about 100,000 units, learning units, within our universe. It's called NDLA. And uh, we have found from the users that we're not always able to find the good stuff that they would like to use in one class or in one week. And uh, what we're doing now is that we're trying to use Pinterest to collect or harvest content. And Pinterest ha has a, a fantastic feature in terms of the easy workflow from you, from the point that you see a, a website to the point where you have, uh, uh, have harvested it into your, uh, your, your stack of content. So you can, for instance, say that in this stack, I would like to have German content and this I would like to have Chinese. And there is a three click model from where you see the page until you're in. And the cool thing about this is that for the first, we, um, we can spread our own content in a different manner. 
And secondly, we are trying to use what's called an API. So when you've done that, we can move the content from a Pinterest stack and over to our own learning paths. Um, and in terms of sharing and reusing, this is what we would think would be the first step. Uh, again, because it's really easy for the user and even for a teacher that has a limited amount of time, um, collecting good stuff uh, is really, really easy. Um, so um, for anyone that hasn't tried Pinterest, this is not a commercial for Pinterest, but for anyone that hasn't tried it, uh, it's it's really worth a while. And of course, there's so many people that have already collected content on Pinterest. So you can look at everyone else's boards, as they are called. called. Um, uh, and our plan is really to build a community without, um, without developing uh, the software ourselves and building a community outside our own community. So, so, so is there an exit strategy? I understood that there is an API to, to get the, the things out of Pinterest. Yeah, uh, very, very important um, point you're making there because for our learning paths, at the second we have sort of drawn the, the, the link between Pinterest and learning paths, we are the master of our own paths. We're not hard, hardwired to, to Pinterest. But of course, it's a commercial entity. But in the period now where the API functions as it does now, we can in fact pick up uh, a Pinterest stack and bring it over to ourselves. It's not even guaranteed that that will work in the future, uh, but, um, but the exit strategy is that when you make a learning path from Pinterest, it will be easy. And when you do so, you have already exited um, Pinterest as your primary storage, if one would say. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it's it's a very good point you're making, and this, of course, this goes for any any large commercial uh, entity that you might use as a side project. Also for Facebook, by the way. So, so um, let's talk a bit about didactics. Is it is there a pedagogical agenda behind your work? Is it uh, is the similar approach you use for all your subjects? Uh, we have uh, um, uh, we have a very uh, I would say a very visionary and 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 um, well thought through uh, strategy. We have a good team. I'm not a, uh, I'm a technician, but I can say from from uh, my experiences that we have um, a very solid foundation. Uh, but that foundation sometimes um, is not in line with, for instance, Khan Academy because there is a huge debate in Norway in terms of measuring the student uh, and storing data on the student and so forth. Um, but we have a very solid pedagogical platform, but that is not a non-technical issue for us. So my job is to sort of adapt to that, uh, that um, um, strategy. And, and it's in Norway, it's, it's, it's uh, difficult because it always starts with what's called the Hele Menesha, or the the whole human being we're not only teaching the math but we're teaching them to be good people you know and uh, and traditionally there has been some sort of a conflict between uh, gamification of uh, something important and creating a good person uh, but i think they are merging now so so um, but 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 yes we have um we have over the last year um uh, a man called leonard vordal has been responsible uh, in NDLA to redevelop that strategy uh, and it's um, whenever you bring um, a, a couple of glasses of wine to the table and you start d discussing this topic you will have a, a, a great night because there's always uh, there is always um, a good discussion is, is this also something that is debated in, in the um, what is the name the board so they say like uh, you have to go more into this pedagogical um, direction or uh, mm. are they only saying let's make something for Chinese? <laughs> um, I'm not going to talk behalf of, be on behalf of our board, but um, what I would say, this is really a core discussion for everyone involved. Um, so, so in that sense, um, I am, um, I'm, prov I'm, I'm only providing opportunities. For the, and, and everyone joins in. Even I do, even though I'm not a teacher. Uh, and and our, and our board uh, represents teachers uh, and owners. So yes, they would most definitely be. be. Are they free to leave? 
the 18 regions are they free to leave uh, they are absolutely free to leave we have uh, that has happened once uh, one region left and came back um, um, so yes uh, this happened maybe three or four years ago um, after a political decision uh, they left uh, they wanted to go in another direction and even though they left uh, their students kept being on top of our list of students that used our solution that's it that's the concept of OER um, but uh, if, if I could say so, they came to their sensors and uh, they came back. So. so is there like, I don't know, a commitment for one, two, three years? Or? Uh, well, there is not. Uh, so politically, they can, they can leave mostly any time, uh, any of the regions. Uh, but of course, there is some sort of understanding, I would think. Uh, I again, uh, only seen from the outside, that this is not a short-term project. So... Um, it has not been a, a great issue because the commitment has been strong. Um, and I think uh, when you see the solutions and you see the, wide, uh, the widely uh, used content, because we have, mind you, 250,000 users in our target group, and we have about 65,000 visitors on a normal good day. And that is like one-third, maybe one-fourth of the users every day. So, um, so uh, in that term, uh, I would say that um, that might be the reason why we w we are uh, in it for the long haul because we can see that users are are are, ex are using uh, the solutions and it's increasing steadily uh, over time. So, what are the next steps for your work? You already said now it's more about the the reusage of the content. Yeah, uh, the, the there are two things that we have found to be interesting to work with. First of all, uh, letting the users uh, draw their own path through our content. Uh, right now, you mostly have one sort of preferred way to go through our content connected to the curriculum. In the future, we would like all uh, the teachers and students to create their own path uh, through our content. Also because we want them to diversify the, 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 the path between students. That is one main strategy, and we're, we're, we're launching a solution uh, in mid-June that we called Ladingstier, which is the Norwegian word for learning paths. Um, uh, that is one, one, one sharing strategy. Uh, the other one is, in fact, crowdsourcing. So within the next 18 months, um, uh, and doing that over a period of 18 months uh, is important for us because we always start with the users. Um, and we're even strong, uh, stronger in that area, uh, and we're stronger, uh, committed to that area right now than, uh, than ever before. Um, and we're looking to engage the user in different levels. So you have the hardcore sh reuse and share person, and you have the person that might be a bit skeptical but can see a misspelling or a wrong year when they see it. Uh, and we want to make an easy to use a feedback loop for both of those and a reuse concept if you want to make your own version of one of our uh, um, what we call nodes that's that's uh, a, a learning object uh, and we even want to have a system that might look like what's called the open source sort of um, um, commit uh, act where you say I've made a, be a better version of this uh, object than you guys uh, please uh, look at it and, and reuse it if you want to. We want that as well. Um, uh, so that is going to be a main um, strategy. And um, what we would like to do is engage the users to keep the quality high. Because we have to. So those are the uh, two things. Learning paths and user engagement. Okay. Anything else Germany should learn about the NDLA? Um, no, I think I think uh, I think uh, I think you should learn also uh, look at the, uh, the Wikimedia Foundation in Germany. You have a strong culture in Germany, uh, as perceived from the outside anyway, in terms of reuse and sharing. Um, and of course, the only thing I can say is that you guys have more people than us. Uh, so the business model for you guys to do something that looks like NDLA would be darn good. Okay, uh, I, I would like to ask you to do a bonus track on this podcast. Right. So now we uh, finished talking about the NDLA and um, 
so just imagine I, I was blind. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the question would be, where are we? What is this house? Uh, not, not how does it look like. It's also interesting. It's a great place for learning and working, I think. Mm. But uh, maybe you can tell us the story behind this house that we are working in. Uh, well, the, b right now we are in the house of communities. Uh, in uh, this English uh, term. This is a house that is um, in the center of Oslo. It's a very nice nice house, uh, modern uh, uh, architecture. Uh, and it's a very simple concept. It was started maybe five years ago, uh, where uh, the, the local businesses, tech businesses, or public entities like ourselves, we pay for the rooms uh, during daytime. And at night, the communities can rent the rooms for free. Still, the rooms are just as professional, the, the equipment is good, uh, and the concept has been growing. So when you see the, the, the stairs and you see the logos, more and more companies are joining. Um, and, uh, and it's very centrally located. So if you, for instance, are a community of, of hackers and you want people to just gather after work, uh, it's, it's very central in, in, in Oslo. From here to the castle, it's like a five-minute walk. So, um, and for us in uh, NLA, we're, we're, it's important for us to support also, uh, also the communities um, uh, in any way we can. Of course, this is just a small contribution for us uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a sponsor of the communities at night. So in the daytime, it's for workshops, trainings? Anyone. So if you're a commercial entity that wants to rent a whole house, you can do so, yes. Uh, and as you, you were here together with me last night, You saw when we left, the, the main room filled up with people. I couldn't spot what kind of community that was, but uh, that is a pro bono uh, thing. So if you have a good case, of course, if you're selling something and you try to join uh, at night, that's not going to fly, but um, mostly that is not the problem. Mm -hmm. and, and the daytime use of, of the companies is like trainings and workshops too. Yeah, So it's absolutely. basically it's the same usage, but by different groups. Yeah, different, uh, uh, different groups, uh, commercial and non-commercial. Okay, so do you have like a kind of plan where you have to sign when you want to do a workshop like we do, uh, are doing yesterday and today? So you say the NDLA needs this room for two days. Yeah, then it's like booking a room at, at any hotel, yes. Uh, so now, right now, I'm, I'm planning something in May um, and, uh, and uh, it's, it's a normal thing. And you have catering and you have all the, all the usual stuff. Um, and... Uh, uh, For the communities, there, there, there's also um, foundations that can fund the extras because, of course, the food doesn't come with the room. Um, I myself has had, uh, have had uh, award shows, not uh, uh, in this building in particular, but in the um, building just beside it, where, where um, a foundation called Nug Foundation, a Norwegian Unix Series Group, sponsored the food. So if you're a community, there's, there are different options of sort of both having rooms to do it in, uh, without having to go down in the cellar or something. This is, this is uh, where we're sitting now. It's, uh, I would say, a really professional uh, conference uh, uh, arena. And you can have a foundation sponsor, uh, sponsor the food. So it's somewhat a creative commons place. I would say so. Yeah, it's really... Um, um, you, you can draw that line, yes. That's, uh, that's, um, it's really, uh, in terms of uh, reusage, yes. And, and the fact is, most places like this, They, they are empty at night, or, or more, more often yeah. than not. So, yes. uh, so why not use a room at night for free? Great story. Thanks for sharing your story. All the best for your work. And uh, we'll talk about uh, your next steps, maybe in 2017 or 18. It would be great to have you on the podcast again. Hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Das war Zugehört, der Podcast rund um Open Educational Resources. Weitere Informationen zum Podcast finden Sie unter www.open-educational-resources.de slash podcast. <lacht>